This morning's reading is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, and we're reading together verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Send him an invitation to our church. <laughs> he wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down and at once welcomed him gladly. But all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and I, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save all who were lost. And the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. What an amazing morning that we have had this morning. I have to say what a blessing it is for people to come from halfway around the world and to just turn up and to actually bring such a blessing to us. It's absolutely amazing. I can't say thank you enough. I was sitting, as uh, many of you would have seen me, on the front row, and as soon as you started singing, the force of that uh, amazing chorus kind of hit my soul, it penetrated, and it divided bone and marrow. And such is the Word of God that it can enter into us and it can feed us and I have to say what an amazing morning and what some fantastic songs we have had sung and we say blessing to you, thank you so much. People who know me will know I'm quite an emotional person, I often wear my heart on my sleeve and the tears were running down my face and I don't know how else to describe the feeling of God's Holy Spirit moving through powerful worship song that actually goes straight into our very being, spirit to spirit. And we have had that uh, feeling and sense this morning. And somehow, I need to bring a sermon um, after what we've just heard and experienced, and I will do my best to do that. There are many sermons that come in life, and we have heard sermon in song, haven't we? We have heard about some great uh, men from the Bible. We heard about Nicodemus, he was told he had to be born again. We heard about Samson. Although he was strong, he needed to humble himself before God. And today I want to talk about uh, another man in the Bible, from our Bible reading. His name is Zacchaeus, who I'm going to call Zac. You will know this story, and actually the force of what we've heard in song actually penetrates back to when Zacchaeus met Jesus. The, the, uh, the songs were putting out to us, who will love Jesus and who will follow my Lord? who will commit their life to Jesus and who will follow him. And that has been the story of the Bible all the way through from beginning to end. The Messiah is coming, he's come to save the world. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus came to a lost world and he brought the message of the gospel of salvation in his body and in his blood. And it has had the same impact from generation to generation from men and women and children. It has penetrated bone and marrow. It has brought spiritual food to people. 
And people have had their lives changed because they turn to Jesus Christ. That is the power of our Lord. And I want to tell you about a man called Zacchaeus who had a new perspective some 2,000 years ago. And you know, many of you know, that Helen and I, I, I was a prison chaplain uh, serving the Lord in uh, HMP Loudon Range in Nottingham for over 10 years. Helena also ended up being employed as a lay chaplain and we worked together in this prison with uh, ending up with a thousand men, most of them lost, most of them in desperation, and yet the light and the shining power of Jesus was in that prison and people were becoming saved. You and I know that prisons are full of sinners. Prisons are full of lost people. And it's very easy to say that because you and I know and they know that they have broken the law. They've been caught, they've been found out, they've been incarcerated behind bars. Prisons are full of rough and tough men, but also quiet and sensitive men and women. Everyone has a story to tell. And do we believe the stories that they tell us? Well, that's a good question. You know, it's so easy to judge people when they are behind bars and also to make judgments about them. They must all be bad men and women. I am reminded that Jesus Christ said, no one is good, only God is good. And I took that very much to heart. And in a way that was kind of like my motto, I am not a good person. My attitude in dealing with difficult people in a difficult place called a Category B prison was to realize that the whole of humanity has fallen short of the glory of God. There is none that is righteous, no, not one. And realizing that enabled me to minister and to share God's love to men behind bars. To realize we are all in the same boat with those behind bars actually is quite a shock. I'm a good person. Surely my good deeds will gain favor with God. Nicodemus said, surely I'm a good person. I have followed the law of God. And yet Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You need to be born spiritually from heaven. I am a good person. Am I? No, not one. Do you see, outside of being in Christ, there is no hope. Our smallest sin, the smallest thing, just think about the smallest little thing that you have done, which you know in your conscience is not right. That has separated you and me from God. You know, there are many wonderful Christians who work in prisons as volunteers. They come from all denominations and they belong to an organization called Prison Fellowship. And you may know that Prison Fellowship was started by a prisoner started by a government official who ended up in prison and his name was Chuck Colson. In 1974, Chuck Colson, who was a former top aide to President Nixon, voluntarily pled guilty to obstruction of justice on a Watergate-related charge. He had just become a Christian. As a new Christian, he wanted to follow Jesus and sort his life out. And that meant he owned up to doing something wrong and it put him in Alabama's Maxwell prison. Chuck Colson said this, I found myself increasingly drawn to the idea that God had put me in prison for a purpose and that I should do something for those that I had left behind. And he came out from prison but with a brand new mission. He decided to mobilize the Christian church Colson emerged from prison with a new mission. He wanted to mobilize the Christian church to minister to those who were lost in prison. And he founded Prison Fellowship in 1976. It has become that nation's largest Christian nonprofit organization, serving prisoners, former prisoners, and their families, and is a leading advocate for criminal justice reform. On April the 21st, 2012, Chuck Colson passed away but his legacy continues. The work of Prison Fellowship continues and the lives of many people have been touched as a result. 
Now, as a prison chaplain, I was responsible for PF and their activities in the prison, and Helena had a passion for supporting the work of volunteers in prison, and she ended up running a particular course that Prison Fellowship had devised in the area of restorative justice. Now, our normal, I challenge you, I challenge you, when you think of a prisoner, when you think of someone who has broken the law many ingenious ways, I challenge you to think, what is your view of them? I think our normal view of sinners like them, who should be in prison, can be so easy like this. Trail them, nail them, and jail them. Track them down, pin them to the cross of their sins, bang them away out of harm's way, even to forget about them. That's how society often would deal with it. But the challenge today is this. How does Jesus deal with it? As I said, Prison Fellowship developed what's known as a restorative justice force. But what is restorative justice? Restorative justice is what it says. It is an approach to justice in which the response to a crime is first to organise a meeting between the victim and the offender, and second, with representatives of the wider community. The idea is this, that repentance and a restitution can take place and relationships can be restored. Does that sound familiar to you and I as Christians? It should do. Because restorative justice is not a new concept. It is exactly what we read in our Bible. It's exactly what we have read in our Bible today about the rotten chief tax collector called Zacchaeus. But he had an encounter with Jesus. So let's have a look at this man in a history of men and women in the Bible who have had a restorative encounter with Jesus that changed their lives. Zach, as he was known in the Prison Fellowship story of the same name, was a chief tax collector. A chief tax collector. Every word of the Bible means something, and this description of Zach, of Zacchaeus, is to tell us something about who he is. But more importantly, how the society of the day would look at him how the society would view him. You see, a chief tax collector was a Jew working for the Romans, collecting taxes for the Romans. But, being a chief tax collector, they would add a cut on top for himself. Here's a bit for the Romans, and here's a bit for me. He was a chief tax collector. He may well have had people working for him, collecting taxes over the whole province. Zach, as the Bible said, he was wealthy. He was wealthy. But was he truly rich? Of course he wasn't. The real things of life, he didn't have. Zach was cash rich, but he was friends poor. Zach was an outcast, a prisoner to his greed and to his money. Zach was despised by his fellow Jews as there was no one lower in their minds than tax collectors. Zach was a traitor, despised by the local community much more than he was feared. Now our Bible story tells us that Zach had heard about Jesus. The fame of Jesus had spread throughout the province. Jesus was coming to his town. The saviour, the saviour and fragrance of Christ had reached Zach before the person had turned up in town. Zach had heard amazing things about Jesus, probably because Jesus seemed to do good things. Probably because he had heard that Jesus met with the down and outs of society. Zach knew that in society he was a down and out. He had the riches of the trappings of this world but he had nothing. His heart probably, well, I, I'm sure, was broken. He had a veneer. Every time he walked down the road, the people would part like the Red Sea. He would be on his own. And people would despise him, hate him, and talk about him 
behind his back. Did he deserve it? Maybe he did. Do people deserve the punishment that they get? Yes, they do. But it's more than punishment. There is a way back into society. There is a way back to live a fulfilled life. Will anyone follow Jesus? Would a man like this come to Jesus? Well, of course he did. He did come to Jesus. Zach wanted to see him. He heard he was coming to town. He wanted a glimpse of this amazing man. He just wanted to see him. What would happen if he saw him? Now the Bible in verse 3 says this. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. Now I've entitled uh, this sermon, A New Perspective, A New Perspective. And as you and I travel through life, the things that happen to us in life, sometimes you and I need to look at those circumstances from a new perspective. And I want to give you a couple of new perspectives this morning. One, actually about our Bible text. Uh, one uh, which I've thought about uh, many times every time I read this text. And I just wonder whether you, like me, have wondered about this verse. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crown. You see, I want to give you a different perspective. I am sure immediately all of us think that Zac was short. I'm sure that immediately we speak about Zach as the short man who climbed the sycamore tree. But I want to give you a new perspective on that particular verse. You see, maybe it wasn't actually Zach who was short, but actually maybe it was Jesus. You see, in our cultures, we often think of Jesus as being the perfect human specimen. Tall, dark, and handsome. And so often we see him in the iconography with blue eyes, maybe even blonde hair. But I want to tell you, Jesus does not look like that. We think Jesus is the Son of God, he must look good. Well, go back thousands of years, they, they looked at Saul, he was head and shoulders above everybody else, and they thought, he looks good, we'll have him as our king. Men, women, and children look on the outside, but God looks at the heart. So this new perspective, maybe for some of you, from the Bible, we are told in Isaiah 53 too. He, and this means Jesus, grew up before him, that means the Father, like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty, no majesty, to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. I wonder whether it was Jesus who was short, surrounded by the crowd, so Zach couldn't see him. Zach needed to get a new perspective. He needed to find a different way to view what was going on in the crowd. Every time Jesus turned up, people thronged around him. They wanted to be with him. And you can imagine Jesus surrounded by a crowd. You could not see. So Zach got himself a new perspective. He had a new way of seeing, and he went up the sycamore fig tree. You know, sometimes we need a new perspective too. Sometimes we can be comfortable. Sometimes we need to move out, climb a tree, or get out of the boat, walk on water, of course symbolically speaking, and have a new look at what Jesus Christ is doing. Over the past few weeks, we've, we've preached about don't look back. We've preached about keep on going forward. God is doing a new thing. God is always on the move. And here, perhaps some of us need a new perspective of Jesus and what we are in him and what Jesus is calling us to do. So, Zach, wanting to see Jesus, he climbs the tree to look down on the spectacle before him, and he can see him. He watches him coming, hidden in the midst of the crowd. He can see him coming. And then all of a sudden, the encounter happens. Do you know, Jesus wants to encounter every living human being. Do you know, Jesus wants to do that. Jesus loves sinner. sinners. It says here, the Son of Man came to seek and save that was lost. That, 
which was lost. Jesus is looking for people, for outcasts. People is looking for people who know that they're not good enough on their own, that they need an encounter with Jesus. And here is Zach up the tree, and Jesus gets close, and the encounter happens. Whoa! Very unexpected to the perception and the perspective of the crowd. Jesus stopped at the spot, and he looked up, and he saw this chief, tax collector and what did he say when Jesus reached the spot he looked up and said to him Zacchaeus come down immediately I must stay at your house today I bet Zac had never even heard those words before he had certainly never been invited to anybody else's house for supper and here we have Jesus the author and perfecter of the universe, the author and the perfecter of faith, the Jesus who wants to encounter every living person, and here he is in Zach's life, and he's there under the tree. I must stay at your house today. Oh, the joy from Zach. Me? He wants to eat with me? Prisoners in the prison, when they heard about the love of Jesus, that Jesus hung on a cross and shed his blood for every single sin they'd done, they could not grasp it. Why would he do that for me? I'm a terrible person. I don't deserve saving. Well, actually, Jesus loves you anyway. Jesus loves sinners. And he's come to call you back into relationship with God. Me, says Zach, he wants to eat with me. I eat with no one. They reject me. I walk into a public eatery and they all move away from me. Jesus wants to eat with me, says Zach. Zach is now having more than just a viewing new perspective. He's actually having an encounter and an experience with the living God. And what was the perspective of the onlookers? What was their reaction to the challenge of Jesus coming to, to seek and to save that which was lost? Well, we read this in verse 7. Attitudes don't change down societies, you know that. Groups of people are always so willing to judge and to gossip. Verse 7, all the people saw this and began to mutter. He, meaning Jesus, has gone to be the guest of a sinner. How disgusting, they all say. Not are they only now judging Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, who has committed many sins, but now the crowds are judging King Jesus, who is the perfect human being without sin. From the same mouth, we can bless and curse God. And here they are, cursing God and cursing man. You know, I often wonder, um, in terms of the scripture, verse 8 comes to the conclusion of the story, but I often wonder what that meal was like with Jesus. I often wonder... What a meal that was. We don't know what was discussed at dinner. What we do know is Zach's response to the love of Jesus for him. Jack, Zach had a new perspective. He not only climbed the tree to see Jesus, but now his whole life has been shaken up by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now he is completely shaken. Now he is becoming, dare I say it, the salt of the earth. He has come from sinner to salt. He has come from one perspective, from darkness. He's come into the kingdom of light. And Zach just was so overwhelmed by this encounter. So overwhelmed that he actually put back into society more than he took out. He gave half of his possessions to the poor in verse 8. And if he had cheated anyone, he gave back four times the amount, which went beyond the law of God in the book that he was reading in the Old Testament. Zach went beyond the law of God. You see, the law of God said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I've stolen a denarius from you. I need to give you one back. No, he gave back four times. What an overflow of the joy of salvation in that man's life. He went beyond, beyond to make restitution and he was reconciled with Jesus 
and Jesus publicly reconciled him to the crowds around. Zach stood in front of everybody and he made his statement to the whole community. I'll give half my possessions to the poor and if I've cheated anyone, I'll give four times back the amount. Zach had a new perspective. He had found Jesus and his life had changed completely. So going back to our experience in the prison in closing, at the end of the restorative justice course that basically looked at the person of Zach, what did he feel like? What did the crowd think of him? What must he have thought when he saw Jesus? How did he respond? And then what did the crowd, how did the crowd look at Zach? The hatred and the, because you can see that's how society looks at prisoners. Is there any way to be restored, to be put back together? Is there any way to follow Jesus and to be put right in society? So at the end of this course, uh, what the prison fellowship people would do is they would invite members of the community in to hear what was known as an act of restitution. Hardened criminals standing in front of a group of people. Some were lawyers, some were magistrates, some were police officers. And we would gather in the chaplaincy and then the men would get up and they would say something, give a testimony, they would show something, write a poem, they would draw a picture as an act of restitution owning up to what they've done, saying that they are sorry and seeking to move on. And I have to say, there were some amazing and very moving moments from some prisoners, not all, but those who had truly been affected by the story, those, believe it or not, people came to have an encounter with Jesus through the story, and their lives too were changed. They accepted Christ as Lord and Saviour. So there were some amazing moments that we witnessed in the prison with people that society said was like that. Do you know church? Do you know Salt Church? We are in the restorative business. Yes. We are in the restorative business in a world of lost souls in their sin, not knowing Jesus, no way out. Our new church name, everybody is getting it now, is Salt Church. Sought to bring savour to the poor, to cover over wrongdoing, to share the flavour of the gospel of Christ, to point to Jesus for salvation. Our mission is to share the salt of Jesus and invite people to join his church, to be born again, spirit and spirit, and to become, as we said this morning, the body of Christ on earth. Yeah. There is a call out in this whole region yes. for people to become bricks in the building of God living bricks. Now, I believe our building location, for me, is a prophetic picture of our mission. On one side is a garage car reclamation business, taking parts from broken cars, restoring them to be used again in roadworthy cars. On the other side of us is a soil reclamation yard, tons of old soil mixed up with huge rocks and debris goes in at one end and then wonderful soil fit for purpose comes out of the other end. We are right in the middle of a reclamation yard. We are in the reclamation restoring business. When I say business, I don't mean man's business, I mean God's yes. business. Yes. God's business, Jesus' business is to come, to see, and to save the lost. We are salt church. We are into people reclamation. Amen. Now, to end. Zach was a sinner, a chief tax collector, a chief sinner. Zach knew it. People are aware of their imperfections. Jesus met Zach, he restored him. And through Zach's repentance and giving back what he had taken plus more, Zach was reconciled, reunited, not only with God as his father, but with his community. 
Because after all, says Jesus, he's a son of Abraham. He was a Jew, but now a follower of Jesus. Interestingly, Zach ended up, interestingly, Zacchaeus ended up living up to his name. You see, in Hebrew, the meaning, and I say to you again and again, every word of scripture means something, and this for me is profound. Interestingly, Zach ended up living up to his name. You see, in Hebrew, the meaning of the name Zacchaeus is clean and pure. Isn't that amazing? You know, God has written this with all sorts of perspectives so that we can glean a new perspective. Zacchaeus was called Zacchaeus for this very moment. That this man who was dirty, this man who's an outcast, this man who is broken, this man who is hiding himself, would become clean and pure from an encounter with Jesus. That, for me, is incredible. Incredible. Jesus came to make dirty people clean. Jesus came to wash their sins away in his own blood, that they would be clean and pure in God's sight. Salt Church, like Jesus in verse 10, where it says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That is a call to us to do the same. We are in the reclamation business, perfectly located, with a prophetic picture around us. We are to restore people, not by ourselves, but through the power of Jesus and his Spirit. I believe that God in his wisdom, you know God has a sense of humour, and God speaks in so many different ways. And often Jesus said, he, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what God is saying. He who has eyes to see, let us see what God is doing. And uh, I like to, I'm quite a creative person at times. And, and often I, I, I see the connections. I just make connections. And so I'm seeing all of the connections. We're in the reclamation business. We're perfectly, uh, perfectly a uh, place. God in his wisdom, his mercy, and in his humour has placed us right in the middle of the reclamation yard physically as a reminder to us spiritually to now go out and do it. To find people, to attract people, to meet people, to share the preserving, seasoning, salt of the gospel of Jesus. To invite people, as Jesus did, to invite people to have an encounter with Jesus actually through an encounter with us. Yeah. Do you know the power of inviting someone to dinner is a very big, powerful thing? Yeah. People like to eat together, and if your cooking is good, and they like it, then actually the environment is excellent for just sharing and talking. And maybe just to invite them to the new church location. We are there to do as Jesus did. We are there to point to Jesus, to have a different perspective, to help people find who Jesus is and to invite them into a relationship with him. Church, that's a great mission, isn't it? Yes. And God is doing it. God is moving us and he has moved us on. Amen. 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 Let, us, let us pray. I, I was so moved. That's why I've still not recovered from those songs. I've still not recovered and He's given me a passion. And I think with a message like that, I have to actually invite anyone who does not know Jesus Christ and who is interested in knowing more to do something about that. If you have sat there and said, I feel I should know more, or I've got a question about something, then we are a church where we will accept you, we will take your questions and we will give you answers. So let's just close in a prayer at the moment.